Okay, so I'm going to come at this, um, this whole um, area uh, kind of back to front, and I want to talk about a completely secret society um, that nevertheless, weirdly, was full of journalists and full of people involved in um, the, the popular occulture of the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and a, con a sort of investigation, really, of how they negotiated this um, uh, kind of public and private set of behaviours. Um, so I'm going to talk particularly about the Ghost Club, which was a dining club uh, of gentlemen. Um, they had a ladies' night in 1929. <laughs> um, didn't go down so well, didn't work. Um, and it was first formed in London in 1882, and it met in that, this version, uh, this iteration, uh, once a month between October and June in London clubs and West End restaurants uh, for 54 years uh, until its dissolution in 1936. And you might know it because it was revived as a more public and society gathering by Harry Price. Uh, and then again after the Second World War, and it's still sort of going. You might see uh, events uh, of um, the Ghost Club in London if, you, if you're a club of war type. Um, but it's a very different entity from what was a very exclusive and cohesive first version. And there are some claims that this um, society goes back to the Ghost Society in Cambridge in 1855, but that's not the case. This was a, a, a slightly different organisation. Well, the Ghost Club met, as its rules stated, in strict confidence, a command of secrecy that was constantly talked about uh, amongst the members. The first rule of Ghost Club is therefore you do not talk about Ghost Club. This insistence on secrecy meant that the gentlemen who became brother ghosts, as they were called, were, to quote one member uh, from 1886, able to mention facts of such an intimate nature with the full assurance that his observations would be listened to and appreciated by his brethren. Uh, there was only one occasion when the newspapers caught a whiff of the existence of the Ghost Club in 1908, with brief, speculative, uh, and slightly mocking columns in The Observer and The Daily Mail. But that prompted an absolute crisis and a, and a really rigorous inquiry into this breach of gentlemanly vows. The brother who had talked to a press man, uh, he was clearly not a gentleman, uh, and had his confidence broken, seriously weighed his resignation, as did the president of the society, who had already received, as he put, chaffing letters uh, about his membership of this club. It was emphasised again that from the first, the very existence of the club was not to be talked about in mixed company. For some brothers, it was a professionally awkward to have it known that one belonged to such an association. And again, it was said, you must not mention any names uh, if there were any chance of our remarks becoming public property. Interesting phrase. So the cloak of silence fell again, and the brother ghosts could settle back into the allure of a secret society that, as George Simmel talks about in his study of secret societies, secures the possibility of a second world alongside the obvious world. Now, it's striking, I think, that so little work has been done on this grouping, since the club included amongst its 83 members over 50 years the chemist Sir William Crookes, the painters John Varley and Sir William Blake Richmond, the writer and diplomat and mystic Lawrence Oliphant, the poet W.B. Yeats, and whose dining guests you were allowed to bring along, um, the occasional guest, included Arthur Conan Doyle, the journalist William Stead, the prominent African colonial administrator Sir Harry Johnston, who talked about his telepathic command of black natives, and the keeper of the Egyptian rooms of the British Museum, Ernest Wallace Budge. Now, there has been one splendidly utterly hopeless history of the Ghost Club, uh, which tends only to list with suitable deference the minor aristocrats and long forgotten celebrities who attended meetings of the revived public iteration of the club, which included Doris Stokes, the music hall co comedian Arthur Askey, the goon show's Michael Benteen, and Cyril Wilkinson, known then as the Society Ear Piercer, widely respected <laughs> in London for the man who pierced the ears of the Queen Mother. 
Well, this lack of work on the Ghost Club might, I suppose, be ascribed, ascribed to the club's eccentric discussions of all things psychical, spiritualist, theosophical, astrological, anthropological, and occult. Very mixed um, terrains of debate. It may be that the very small and very private Ghost Club had been squeezed out of this terrain by the much more public formation of major institutions such as the British National Association of Spiritualists in 1875, formed in Great Russell Street, just opposite the British Museum, or from the same address, the much more uh, public Society for Psychical Research in 1882. Those both led very public campaigns and had hundreds of members who contributed with much energy to popular print culture, social circles of the bourgeois public sphere, published their own journals, of course. Uh, even other small societies of that time, of the occult revival, were founded on grand proclamations of total secrecy, including ones, of course, backed up with threats of black magical attack for any public transgression, such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, founded in 1887. All of these we know an incredible amount about, but not about the Ghost Club. Was it that the Ghost Club was simply too successful in hiding itself away from the public? Well, that might hold more water if the club had not appointed a secretary each year who meticulously recorded a set of minutes that included detailed summaries of each and every ghost story told, building up an archive of 5,000 handwritten pages of minutes, each one signed off by the president and read and approved at each subsequent meeting. This weird bureaucratic archive, what Gary Viswanathan would call the ordinary business of occultism, offers an extraordinary insight into the private clubland world of eminent Victorian and Edwardian gentlemen. Since the embargo on quoting any of these pages was lifted in 1961, and the locks have been removed from the catch plates 25 years after they were deposited in the British Library, it's time to start bringing the interlight these peculiar pages. Of course, the subscript of this is not much work has been done on this because it's 5,000 pages of terrible handwriting. <laughs> My argument will be that it is useful to relate these minutes to both the public journalism and highly metafictional club tales that flourished in these same late Victorian periodicals, between the, the tales that often work to dissolve boundaries, there's that idea again, between history and folklore, fact and fiction, public and private, scholarship and invention. In other words, we're in the same space as Stevenson's collaborative New Arabian Nights, or his The Suicide Club, or the occasions of M.R. James's readings of his ghost stories to his Cambridge friends, or Jerome K. Jerome's much more knowing staging of his After Supper ghost stories, first collected in 1891. And some people might know the Ghost Club's existence through its light fictionalization by Arthur Gray in a comic short story from 1919 called The Everlasting Club. Um, and I'll explain why it's called that. Uh, and it was also fictionalized again slightly by J.M. Barry uh, in the 1930s. So it's kind of intermixing this fact and fiction all the time. Okay, some background. The Ghost Club was formed in November 1882 by the Reverend William Stainton Moses, we've heard about before today, uh, and his friend Alaric Watts, a very trusted employee of the Inland Revenue. Stainton Moses was an Oxford graduate of Exeter College and a Church of England curate who had been investigating spiritualism in 1872. After several visits to the celebrated mediums Hearn and Williams, who uh, worked out of Lamb's Conduit Street, and Charles Williams was the medium for the famous seance with George Eliot and Charles Darwin. Um, after visiting them, Stainton Moses had discovered his own powers of communication with the dead. And in fact, he was to become one of the most respected automatic writing mediums of the late Victorian era. Um, he received messages from everyone from Aristotle onwards through his spirit control imperator. Stainton Moses was a tireless campaigner for the spiritualist cause as a journalist and an editor of, uh, amongst other things, but mainly the weekly journal Light. And he published loads of articles under his evasive pseudonym M.A. Oxen. 
uh, which at once concealed his name, but also expressed a certain social and intellectual standing. So, you know, this is, this is someone who has an Oxford degree. That must be right. Stainton Moses therefore bridged both the, the middle class seance circle, which was the frequently authenticated by its very privacy, i.e. you weren't vulgar, you weren't paying for it, it wasn't part of this postal order thing, but uh, an authentic private space, and of course the con contested public sphere of publishing. Alaric Watts, meanwhile, was the son of a famous journalist himself, um, who also married Anna Howitt, the daughter of William and Mary Howitt, two of the most respected Quaker journalists and spiritualists in England. Anna Howitt, uh, Alaric Watts's wife, was an artistic child prodigy who illustrated her mother's books from the early teens. And as I'm sure you might know, after marrying Watts, she pursued only spirit drawings, executing all of her artwork during trance states. At the core of the early members of the Ghost Club then was the social circle of Stainton Moses and, and Alaric Watts. And those included the wealthy Dr. Stanhope Spear, who lived just up the road at Mornington Crescent, um, and who employed Stainton Moses as a private tutor for his son after Moses had had to resign from the church. Other members came through the university school where uh, Stainton Moses had taught Professor William Pace. None of these are real professors. Professor William Pace, for instance, and the Frenchman Professor Charles Cassal. Another early member was Arthur Lilly, who would later write a hagiography of Stainton Moses' <coughs> life and death as a key modern mystic in his book, Modern Mystics and Modern Magic. And as a symptom, perhaps, of popular occulture in the 1890s, I note that the second edition of Lilly's book was retitled The Worship of Satan in Modern France. That probably sold a few more copies. Around this uh, core was the journalist um, and lawyer, Charles Massey. Uh, and uh, in the invitation letter um, to Massey, Stainton Moses said, we propose rigidly to confine ourselves to clubbable men. Uh, it was not, therefore, a society, not a public society, but a club built on friendships and designed, he said, hopefully, to exclude cranks. Um, and Massey was the man, of course, uh, that had taken on the defense of spiritualism in the courts against T.H. Huxley and Edwin Ray Lancaster over the prosecution of the medium Henry Slade for fraud in 1876. Massey lost. Slightly later, uh, the journalist A.P. Sinnett uh, also joined. And of course, again, as you're sure you know, when in India, working again as a journalist, the editor of The Pioneer. Sinnett had been persuaded by the occult powers and theosophical cosmology of Madame Blavatsky. Sinnett wrote the most successful, one of the most successful public primers, The Occult World, in 1881, and brought a more uh, ecumenical occult element to the Ghost Club, peppering discussions with very exotic exemplifications. When I was in India, this happened when I was in Ceylon, these sorts of uh, anecdotes. Sinnett was therefore also someone who bridged the public and the private, the exo and the esoteric. The timing of the foundation of the Ghost Club is obviously important. In January 1882, Stainton Moses had been one of the key founders of the Society for Psychical Research, brought into being principally by Professor William Barrett, a physicist and spiritualist, and the, those eminent agnostic Cambridge men, Henry Sidgwick and his former pupils, Frederick Myers and Edmund Gurney. These men were at the heart of the establishment, bringing into the purview of this research figures like Gladstone and Balfour, past and future prime ministers. The tone of the SPR was meant to be rigorously agnostic, um, Huxley's coinage, of course, and its program of research was designed rigorously to exclude the spirit hypothesis, hypothesis at first exploring instead the phenomena of ghostly visitations and the survival of bodily death through new frameworks of energy physics and French and German psychodynamic theories of mind. There was no supernatural for the SPR, only the supernormal, the proleptic promise of scientific explanation by expanded natural law. It was thus rigorously anti-occult in its outlook 
Ghosts were termed veridical hallucinations or phantasms of the living. Haunted houses became phantasmogenetic centers, sites of intense psychic energies. Uh, again, a, the term psychic designed to avoid the spirit hypothesis and coined in Russell Square just over there in 1871. Communication across seance table and across any distance became telepathy. The word coined by Myers the month after the Ghost Club was founded, December 1882. Well, uh, a familiar story, but initially, of course, spiritualists hoped for legitimation from the SPR. Quite soon, however, they came to regard the society as skeptics intent on wrecking the foundation of belief in the spirit world. It caused disquiet, dispute, and then a full-scale split in 1886, led by Stainton Moses and Charles Matthew, Massey, who resigned from the SPR and took about 40 members with them. These brother ghosts were two of the most prominent voices of the spiritualist community at the time. In the Letters Pages of Light, the journal edited by Stainton Moses, quite a number of the private members of the Ghost Club publicly voiced their dismay at the direction of psychical research. Whilst he kept his membership of the club secret, Alaric Watts was keen to point out that the public skeptics of the SPR were private believers in spirits, really. Watts revealed in a letter published in Light, it is within my knowledge, and I violate no confidence in saying so, that Mr. Myers and his most intimate associates of the governing body of the Society for Psychical Research have been investigating the phenomena of spiritualism for years. This was indeed true, but a rather ungentlemanly act to reveal, designed, of course, to undercut the apparently sceptical stance of rival investigators. The founding of the Ghost Club in November 1882 was surely an early escape route from the very public forum of the SPR, which soon was caught up with multiple disputes with scientific naturalists, orthodox religion, and heterodox occultists of various hue in the public sphere. The club, in contrast, was meant as a place for looser conversation, a gathering rather like that a collection of gentlemen who gather at the, to listen to the time traveller at the beginning of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Their convivial talks described in a wonderful Wellsian phrase as having a luxurious after-dinner atmosphere when thought runs gracefully free from the trammels of precision. Each member of the Ghost Club, upon election, was required to quote the rules from his own personal knowledge or some accredited testimony to produce an original ghost story or some psychological experience of interest and instruction once during each year. There was no burden of proof, uh, no fierce contestation in the disputatious public sphere, but an atmosphere of ecumenical, gentlemanly sociality where election was bond enough to secure the words the truth of the word spoken. What did they speak about? Well, from very early on, the minutes expand from an empty record of bureaucratic actions, thank God, into a substantial discursive record of the stories offered by its members. And here's just a sample from one page of what the brothers called their narratives. Mr. Lilly mentioned some experiences of his own. He was an ardent croquet player, as was Hale, the well-known cricketer. At one period of his life, he, Lily, was clairaudient, and in the course of a game, he heard Hale's voice in its natural tones saying, I'll help you with this stroke. He gave himself up, allowing his arm to be guided, and a difficult stroke came off. Next paragraph. Mr. Watts spoke of a circumstance that he had heard from Mrs. Oliphant, the novelist. She was looking out of her window as her husband's funeral procession was leaving the house when she was aware of his presence and he said, is it not interesting to see the body one has washed and dressed for so many years put away? At times, the congenial world of the Ghost Club gives an extraordinary insight into a world of utterly magical thinking, of ghosts, psychic visitations, prophetic dreams, 
astral travels, astrological truths, spirit communications, all experiences usually hidden behind the public demeanour of the modern, sceptical, civilised London gent. They gossip about ghost stories circulated by very prominent men and women. From Lord Roberts, from the eminent naturalist Richard Owen, who founded um, the Natural History Museum, from Lady Margaret Sackville, even from Queen Victoria herself, stories that can only reach utterance in this private sphere, outside public discourse, tales that can never be officially acknowledged or sanctioned. Um, they are firm, firmly of the belief that, that, that Queen Victoria is a practicing spiritualist, but it can't possibly be said in public. Their transgressiveness is, of course, precisely defined by their sense of occlusion from the public sphere and their articulation only in private between clubbable, trustworthy men. At other times, the club pursues details of a particular ghost story with a more ardent scepticism, or as what they understand as scepticism, asking brothers to return with more compelling evidence, or demanding updates on stories uh, of doubtful provenance, or that have been left unfinished or irresolute in some way. For instance, the discovery of a skeleton during building works at a notoriously haunted house in Preston Manor in Brighton provides the chance for them to test the convention that ghosts can be laid to rest once remains are given proper burial. And the details of this story are pursued for two years, 1897 to 1898, uh, before they're quietly dropped. The key founder, Stainton Moses, died in 1892, and several other early members, like Professor Casal and Stanhope Spear, also departed in the first 10 years of the club. As you might expect though, and as the rules of the club reiterated, death of a member is no actual loss to the club. <laughs> Hence, the everlasting club. A roll call of members, alive and dead, those physically present or those only spiritually so, was read out at the beginning of each meeting. As with many of these societies, including the SPR, the club soon wrapped itself in research into its own dead and it was considered a solemn duty for departed members to do their utmost to communicate with other brothers after death. So when brother Thomas Douglas Murray died in 1911, within a month his elected replacement, the poet William Butler Yeats, had met Murray's spirit at a seance, and as the minutes record, when brother Yeats was introduced to him, the ghost of Murray said, I am glad to know the gentleman who took my place. Uh, in the 1890s, sorry, get rid of that, it's a bit annoying. Uh, yeah, it, and there's the SPR people. In the 1890s, the second phase of the club was dominated by Sir William Crookes, the chemist and spiritualist. Crookes had a vested interest in keeping his opinions in the spirit world private after his public support for the scientific claims of spiritualism only resulted in ridicule in 1871. His photographs of uh, the full-scale uh, materialization of the spirit of Katie King in the 1870s, there in his laboratory, um, had damaged not only his scientific reputation, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, the discoverer of the uh, element thallium, but also his business interests, more importantly his business interests, since he was, among many other things, the proprietor and editor of the trade journal Chemical News. Another key figure to join at this time was the socialite, author, and traveler Thomas Douglas Murray, who I've just mentioned, uh, and the man allegedly cursed for bringing back to London an Egyptian coffin lid from Luxor. Um, Thomas Douglas Murray had famously lost his arm. You can't quite see that. Um, that photograph is from the basement of the London uh, Psychic Science College, uh, who have photographs of every single member of the Ghost Club. Uh, because the British Library refused to take the photographs, they just took the minutes. Um, you can't quite see whether or not he's got an arm there, but he definitely shot his own arm off. Um, shooting quail, slit, shot through his own arm, uh, and was considered to be cursed by many people, including Madame Blavatsky. Um, he told elements of his story of this mummy curse again and again and again to the brother ghosts, as if, it, as if the club was a place to work out a kind of defining trauma for him, 
Murray was an active brother, a president of the club, a garrulous gossip about matters occult and psychical until he died, and arguably after he died, in uh, 1911. It was Murray's social contacts that ensured figures like Harry Johnston, Wallace Budge, Arthur Conan Doyle were invited to dine with the club and share their experiences. So there's a brief kind of sketching of the ghost club, and here's a quick um, schematic sense of where we might go with this. Barbara Black's recent work on London Clubland rightly suggests that the expansion of clubs in late Victorian Britain, and it's also a really amazing major phenomenon in America as well, um, helped maintain an elite of ruling class males consolidating power among men and thus ensuring male entitlement. And that's undoubtedly true. As a recent elegiac account of the decline of the London Club observes, in all seriousness, this is a quote from a book from 1984, socialists, like women, are not on the whole clubbable. But since, as Black also observes, the late Victorian model of masculinity was beset by multiple crises, the example of the cl ghost club feels less representative of power accrued in private than a record of the dissolving boundaries of secure male selfhood in the shifting sounds of the boundary between the public and the private. Um, that sense of lack, lack, lack. You know, that's, that's exactly what I think a feeling um, of, of crisis that you get from these discussions. This club, although it longs to bring establishment names and connections into its purview, actually has to hide away from power and authority, grasping that its own views are marginal, weak, and exterior to the bureaucratic structures of institutional, professional, and state power. Well, in his brilliant short reflection on the club story as a genre, the critic John Clute defines the genre as, to quote him, assemblages of tales told within an enabling frame story to a group of companions in a sheltered venue. It is stories like Heart of Darkness, say. It is stories communicated by men for men, foregrounding the space of safe telling in mutual comfort. And Clute notes the intensification of such fictions in the late Victorian period, from Stevenson's Arabian Nights, Wells' The Time Machine, Heart of Darkness, all the way up to John Buchan's uh, Runnergates Club, uh, or The Greenwood Hat by J.M. Barry, which has an interestingly titled story called uh, The Club Ghost. Yet this cluster suggests that they are compensatory stagings of men gathered against the growing storm against the privileges of what Clute calls the darkening world outside. Performative storytelling, foregrounding the act of telling the tale, tries to authenticate and guarantee utterance. However, as we know from vertiginous, unravelling frames of ghost stories like The Turn of the Screw, spectres often glide blithely through any borders to bolster ontological security undoing any confidence in the status of events or the boundaries of the self. The brother ghosts seek a harbour in a storm of materialism, scepticism and the brash discourses of the public sphere, the vulgarity of exotericism. Ironically, their unmanning tales of hauntings and their communing with their own dead becomes an exemplary performance of the undoing of any private hold over public power. Thank you.